the book of secret Hindu ceremonial and talismanic magic. Book two, chapter 11 of the book as a whole, A Restitution of Stolen Robes. This volume contains a knowledge of the teachings of Oriental adeptship gained by the writer from Eastern Sages. It is only published for the student who desires truth and divine wisdom. And as a true disciple is willing to follow it, even while popular opinion and prejudice are looking him square in the face, it is a work that will teach the disciple of truth how to detect the cardinal principles underlying the systems of magic and occultism taught by the sages and seers of old. It has been written in all sincerity and truth. It holds out for wisdom and justice, and teaches of the universal power, God, within the soul of man, without malice or prejudice. You know, this is realizations of yogi. It denies mercy to the enthroned error and refuses to reverence usurped authority. It enunciates truth, and truth demands today credit for its achievements, which have been too long withheld from it by a spoliated past. Divine truth and wisdom demands a restitution of stolen robes and the vindication of calumniated but honest reputation toward no creed, church, worship, or religious faith is the writer's scathing criticisms been directed in any other spirit. Church, sects, creeds, superstition, and schools of theology as mere ephemera of the past and present. Divine wisdom, high seated upon the rock of adamant truth, the soul of all sincere men and women, is alone supreme and eternal. The writer believes in no religion, no creed, no faith, no white or black, which transcends the power and scope of the there's some of this page missing so something the soul nor in miracles whether divine or diabolical if such imply a transgression of the laws of the universal spirit God tutted from all eternity Natu uh, miracles don't mean that natural laws overrun Religion, as far as people say that, oh, it's a particular church or something like that, I don't believe in that either. Um, religion is a relationship between God and humanity, um, the rest of creation, the creation with God and the other creation. Yeah. But a lot of what people mean by religion nowadays, no. Nevertheless, I know that the universal spirit, God, within the human soul has not yet fully uttered itself, and no man has ever attained or even understood the extent of its powers. Man is ever developing newer and stranger sensibilities as well as a better understanding and closer relationship to his legitimate God, who is none other than the universal God spirit within him and throughout all nature. Truth as the essential is always and forever the same. Chisel away the marble that holds the statue in the block, or build granite blocks upward, and the temple is formed and completed. The finished work is only carrying out an old law. The newest of all truths will find their destined other half in the oldest, just as the earliest of all wisdom will find its destined other half in the latest. The human soul who seeks for the 
hidden wisdom in its sanctuaries within, is always confronted with the two bewildering and ever-recurring questions, the first of which is, who, where, what is God? The second is, can I ever see the immortal soul of man, or be able to know of its immortality? It was while seeking to solve these hidden mysteries that I placed myself directly under the charge and instructions of certain masters, endowed with such spiritual and occult powers, and such profound wisdom that I truly designate them as great sages of the East. After becoming... their disciple. They taught me that by combining eternal wisdom with the universal spirit God, the immortality of the human soul may be demonstrated like a problem of Euclid. Now, I'm trying to get a more full scan of the turtle. Um, yep. Female turtle. Um, Chluey Yu, I think, or the name is. These great masters, once I became their disciples, soon convinced me that an, that esoteric wisdom and oriental occultism tolerates no other faith than an absolute, immovable faith in the omnipotence of man's immortal soul. These sages teach that this omnipotence comes from the kinship of man's spirit with the universal soul god. The latter can never be demonstrated by the former. Man's spirit proves soul spirit, and soul spirit proves God's spirit, as one single drop of water proves a source from which it must have come, and he must accept it on faith or reject it altogether. But let one drop which all the rest may be inferred after that. He could by degrees understand that boundless and fathomless oceans of water exist. Blind faith would no longer be necessary. He would have supplanted it with knowledge. When one sees a mortal man displaying tremendous occult capabilities, controlling the forces of nature, and opening to the disciple the wonderful possibilities of universal spirit, God, within his own soul, you know, that's what omnipresent means, is that God's within everything. Um, doesn't mean anything is God, but, you know... Um, the reflective and thinking mind is overwhelmed with the conviction that if one man's soul force can do so much, the possibilities and capabilities of the great universal power uh, of the great universal spirit must be relative as much vaster as the oceans of water surpass the single drop of water in volumes and potency. Let the student know, once and for all, that once you prove the soul of man by its wondrous occult and spiritual powers, you have found God. As the disciple advances mysteries that were claimed to be mysteries will be shown to be no mystery. Things that to the learned, the unlearned mind have only a significance derived from only a slight understanding will he show to be realities. Before the disciple can advance, however, he must enter in spirit and all faith within the temple of divine wisdom and truth. He must be able to look within his spiritual sight, behind the veil of the one that is, was, and shall be. Let man once hear the divine voice of true wisdom speak to him from the mercy seat behind the veil which hides the universal spirit and science, theology, medicine, and every mortal conception. An hypothesis born of ignorance and superstition will lose forever their authoritative character in his sight and understanding. Once the universal spirit, the living God, speaks to man from within his own soul, he will be satisfied to come to the sanctum sanctorum within the temple of occultism, which has always existed within the sacred edifice. A true knowledge of divine wisdom and the universal God is priceless, and it like true occultism and art magic has been hidden only from those who overlooked it, derided it, or denied its existence. From such I expect criticism, censure, and perhaps a withdrawing of their respect. Although none of these spring from the validity of proof nor truth, the authenticated facts of history, 
nor the lack of common sense among some who read this volume. The drifts of human thought is palpability in the direction of liberalism in psychology, science, and genuine thaumaturgic powers. Each year brings the reactionists nearer to the place where they must surrender their despotic authority over the human soul, which they have so long enjoyed and exercised. The impregnable positions of science, psychology, and occultism may be stated in a few words. They shall surely wrest from theology the entire domain of cosmological theory. To the close observer, the end is not difficult to foresee. Centuries of subjugation to church superstitions, ancient myths, and secular instruction by the priest have failed to congeal man's belief in God within his own soul around the decayed and musty nucleus of the blind, blank faith offered by the church. Well, perhaps that's overstating it a bit, but um, we do know that when we say that God is only the beyond, and beyond and put that as just so the furthest, that denies an important role as the closest. Closer than this matter is God to us. The 19th century is witnessing the struggles of the giant of knowledge and truth as he gradually but surely shakes off the Lilliputian cordage and arises to his feet to save souls from misery and sorrow of ecclesiastical bondage. Even the Protestant communion of England and America now engaged in the revision of the text of its oracles. Well, they mean the Bible, right? Will be compelled to show the origin and merits of the text itself. The day of domineering over men with church dogmas has reached its gloaming. This work, then, is a plea for the thaumaturgic powers exercised by Christ and his disciples. The anciently universal wisdom religion as the only possible key to the absolute in science and theology to show that I do not at all conceal from the disciple the gravity of my undertaking, I may say in advance that it would not be strange if the following classes should array themselves against these teachings. The Christians, who will see that I question the evidences of the genuineness of their faith, the scientists, who will find their pretensions to infallibility placed in the same bundle with those of the church, pseudo-scientists will, of course, denounce this work, broad churchmen and freethinkers will find that I do not accept what they do, but demand the recognition of the whole truth men of letters and various authorities who hide their real belief in deference to popular prejudices, the mercenaries of the press who take advantage of its more than royal power and dishonor a noble profession will find it easy to mock at things too wonderful for them to understand. For them, the price of a paragraph is more than the value of sincerity. For many will come honest criticism, but I look to the future. Now, look at what happened with this with the Sufism in America. Sufism now is actually dominated by fundamentalism rather than the liberals. Um, is that, uh, you know, rather than uh, throwing in worship of other than God and other stuff that wasn't Islamic, the biggest Sufi order in America is the Shadaliyah. And again, like most stuff, it's more through literature than actual formal membership. Formal membership is bigger, too. Um, the contest now going on between the party of public consciousness and the party of reaction has always developed a healthier tone of thought. It will hardly fail to result ultimately in the overthrow of error and the triumph of truth. I repeat again, I am laboring for the brighter tomorrow. And it is something a bit more than just consciousness and the reactionary. Because you don't want your faith to be just reactionary, right? Were it possible, I would keep this work out of the hands of many Christians whom its perusal would not benefit, and for whom it was not written. I allude to those whose faith in the respective churches is pure and sincere, 
and those whose sinless lives reflect the glorious examples of Jesus of Nazareth, by whose mouths the Spirit of Truth spake loudly to humanity, such there have been at all times. History preserves the names of many as heroes, philosophers, philanthropists, martyrs, and holy men and women. And how many more lives have lived and died unknown to their intimate acquaintance, unblessed, but by their humble beneficiaries. These have ennobled Christianity, but would have sh shed some luster upon any other faith they might have professed, for they were higher than their creed. The benevolence of Peter Cooper and Elizabeth Thompson of America, who were not Orthodox Christians, is no less Christ-like than that of the Baroness Angela Burdett Coots of England, who is one. And yet, in comparison with the millions who have been accounted Christians, such have always formed a small minority. They are to be found at this day in a pulpit and pew, in place and cottage, but the increasing materialism, worldliness, and hypocrisy are fast diminishing their proportionate number. Their charity and simple childlike faith in the infallibility of their Bible, their dogmas, and their clergy bring into full activity all the virtues that are implanted in their common nature. I have personally known such God-fearing priests and clergymen, and I have always avoided debate with them, lest I might be guilty of the cruelty of hurting their feelings, nor would I rob a single layman of his blind confidence in his church, if it alone made possible for him holy living and serene dying. Well, as much as that's partially true, uh, facts are more important than feelings, so if you can convince the facts, um, but don't just rip faith from, out, from other people without improving. You know, got to offer an improvement with it, just don't debunk here. In analysis of religious beliefs in general, this volume in particular is a direct, directed against theological Christianity, the chief opponent of free thought and truth. It contains not one word against pure teachings of Jesus, but unsparingly denounces their debasement into pernicious ecclesiastical systems that are renewous to man's faith in his immortality, and the great universal spirit, God, and subversive of all moral restraint, this volume casts the gauntlet at dogmatic theologians who would enslave history, science, psychology, divine wisdom, the God power within the soul, and especially the Vatican, whose despotic pretensions have become hateful to the greater portion of enlightened, Christian, uh, enlightened Christendom. So Christianity beyond kingdom is ruled, supposedly by Christianity at this point, uh, but more of like the Umati Muhammad thing, where it's regardless of the rule, is I guess how he's thinking of this. The clergy apart, none but the logician, the investor, uh, the investigator, the dauntless explorer should meddle with books like this. Such delvers, after truth, have the courage of their opinions. <laughs>